Okay, um, let's get started. So uh, uh, um, this is the 28th um, Southern California Geometric Analysis Seminar. So um, this would have been the 30th year, but we had to go two years without it because of the COVID situation. But we are very happy to be back in person and, and just the amazing turnout today really shows that people are ready to get back to in-person conferences much better than Zoom conferences, in my opinion. Um, but uh, department meetings can stay on Zoom. Those don't have to be in person, but conferences are great. Um, so um, I'd like to so I'd thank everyone for coming. Um, I want to mention a big thanks to the NSF for supporting this conference. They're completely, almost completely supporting it. And then um, I want to give a thanks to the administrative support from the Department of Mathematics at UCI and uh, UC, UC Irvine for this new building and letting us use this room. Um, so I think uh, that's it. So I'd like to get started and introduce our first speaker, Richard Bamler from Berkeley, and he'll be talking about uh, theory of Ricci flow and dimension four. All right, um, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here. So in this talk, I want to give you some kind of a status report on um, coming up with a theory of uh, Ricci flow in dimension four. So I want to give you some kind of idea where we're coming from, give you a uh, motivation for the kind of question that I'm interested in, um, then give you um, uh, a picture of how I think that things uh, should end out, uh, uh, should, 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 uh, should look like. And, uh, and then in the end, I want to present our recent uh, uh, results um, um, that I've obtained joint with Eric Chen from UC Berkeley, who's also here uh, on the resolution of conical singularities. Right. So the structure of the talk will be as follows. So first, I'll just give you some brief background on Ricci flow, especially in dimension three, and I'll discuss Ricci flow with surgery and uh, Ricci flow uh, through singularities as a, as a motivation in this dimension. And then I'll pivot to dimension four and uh, talk about the formation of singularity in dimension four. And many of the results that I'll present there are also true in higher dimensions, but I care more about dimension four. And then in the last part, I'll talk about the resolution of conical singularities, uh, with, which again is uh, joint work with Eric Chen. All right, um, so let me start with the uh, motivation. So um, I should uh, tell you what the Ricci flow equation is. So a Ricci flow is given by a smooth family of Riemannian metrics on a fixed manifold M uh, that's parameterized by a time parameter, and it satisfies the Ricci flow evolution equation that says that the time derivative of the metric is minus two times its Ricci curvature. And you know, just roughly speaking, the reason why we care about this equation is that because if we write it down in some nice harmonic coordinates, then it looks a little bit like a heat equation in the um, uh, metric uh, components. Okay? So we expect that the Ricci flow somehow improves the metric, somehow smoothens out the metric uh, if we go forward in time. And the, uh, some of the simplest example of a Ricci flow that um, we can keep in the back of our minds is the example when we start the Ricci flow with a metric that's already Einstein. And in this case, the Ricci flow will just rescale the metric um, um, in time. Okay? So for example, uh, if the Einstein constant is positive, think for example of a round sphere, then the Ricci flow will shrink the sphere uh, until somehow it becomes singular at this time here, where some of the diameter goes to zero and the curvature blows up. Um, um, and then there are the other cases where the Einstein constant is zero or negative. Yep. Um, so uh, this, is, this is a very basic example, but of course we're more interested in what happens to the flow if we start a metric that's not already optimal, that's maybe very bumpy. And then the hope is that the Ricci flow will take this metric to some nicer metric, which somehow reflects the topology of the underlying manifold. Okay? And this is indeed, this indeed completely works out in dimension two. So if we start with any two-dimensional Riemannian manifold, then the Ricci flow will improve this metric and eventually look asymptotically like one of those three models. However, in dimension three, things are more complicated. And this is maybe best illustrated by this famous uh, neck pinch dumbbell example. Okay? So in this example, I'm thinking about a three-dimensional sphere and I'm equipping it with a um, rotationally symmetric metric that looks like a round sphere of radius are one on one side, a round sphere of radius are three on another side, and they're connected by a neck of width R2. So what we know in this case is that the flow 
evolved from this metric always incurs a singularity, but the type of singularity that we see here depends very much on the choice of the radii. So for example, if the radii are comparable to one another, then some of the concavity of the neck creates some negative curvature, and this causes the neck to widen up, and then the, some of the flow will become more and more round, and eventually be asymptotic to this round shrinking sphere. But then on the other hand, if we somehow choose the neck to be somewhat more pronounced, then the positive curvature of the cross-sectional two spheres dominates, and this will cause the neck to contract and then create a local singularity here. Okay, so the interesting thing here is here that there is some singular region where the uh, metric becomes singular, but away from that uh, singularity, the, uh, the, the metric actually survives and converges to some smooth metric uh, at the singular time. And this is a local singularity, and if we zoom into the singularity, we see something that looks very cylindrical. Think of a cylinder S2 cross R, where the S2 factor contracts and the R factor remains constant. Okay? And then there's an intermediate case uh, where somehow the uh, singularity is modeled by some kind of paraboloid, which is called the Brian soliton, but this won't be so important for us here. All right, so this is what happens in the rotationally symmetric case. Um, now, if you want to understand Ricci flow in um, kind of the, in the general uh, setting, then we, would ha we have to perform something that's called a blow-up analysis. Okay? So this is a technique that's fairly common in geometric uh, equations, but since we need it here and I'll need it uh, uh, later, let me just review again the construction here. So here I try to draw a Ricci flow, so the x-axis denotes the manifold and the y-axis denotes time. And the dashed line somehow should indicate that uh, the Ricci flow de develops a singularity at time t. Well, if there's a singularity, then we can find a sequence of points and times such that the curvature along this sequence of points uh, diverges, goes to infinity. And so we say that the sequence of points go, goes into a singularity. And so now we would like to understand some of the local geometry near these points for large i. Okay? And so we do this as follows. We choose a sequence of rescaling factors, lambda i, going to infinity. And then we'll parabolic, parabolically rescale the Ricci flow by lambda i. So we're rescaling distances by lambda i and times by lambda i squared. So this preserves the Ricci flow equation. And then we're going to recenter the time so that the time ti corresponds to time zero. Okay? Okay. So in doing so, we're creating a sequence of Ricci flows that are defined on larger and larger backwards time intervals. And then we can hope that maybe after passing to a subsequence or by choosing these points and rescaling factors appropriately, this sequence of parabolic rescalings in fact converges to some limiting flow, which is then defined for all non-positive times. Okay? And often this is referred to as the singularity model or blow-up model. Right? Okay, so the upshot of this construction here is that it helps us reduce the study of the singularity formation to the classification of possible singularity models. Okay. And so this program could actually be carried out by Perelman in his uh, famous paper, in which he showed that the only possible 3D singularity models of Ricci flow and dimension 3 are the ones that I showed you on the previous slides. The sphere, the cylinder, or the Brian soliton. Okay. So I should say in the last case, there was some additional work by Brendle uh, that characterized the Brian soliton precisely. Right. So in other words, if you look at a Ricci flow that becomes singular, and we somehow go to a point that's somehow almost singular in the sense that the curvature there is very large, then the local geometry near this point looks very either very spherical or very cylindrical or very Brian soliton like okay? And so this idea then helped Perelman to come up with what is called a Ricci flow with surgery. Right. So Ricci flow with surgery is just given by a sequence of Ricci flows def um, parameterized by consecutive time intervals that are defined on manifolds of possibly different topology, and they're related by what is called a surgery construction. Okay? So the precise definition of a surgery uh, is, is a bit convoluted and technical, but um, so instead of giving the precise definition, let me just show you a little movie. Okay? So let's say we start with some Riemannian metric on a three manifold here on the bottom, and then we evolve this metric by the Ricci flow. So let me just stop short of the first singular time. So here we maybe develop this kind of cylindrical singularity. And now what I'll do is I'll locate some cross-sectional two spheres of very small radius uh, diameter delta. And I'm going to cut the manifold open along these two spheres. 
I'm going to throw away the cylindrical and the almost singular cylindrical part, and I'm going to glue in three disks. Okay? So in doing so, I've made the metric kind of less singular, um, and there's more hope of continuing the flow um, using this metric. But I've also changed the topology, but only in a very controlled way. OK, so now I'm going to restart the Ricci flow, and then I'm going to continue the process. Okay? So here, maybe, um, I um, assume I have another cylindrical singularity. And here, I try to somehow indicate that I have some kind of spherical singularity. And in this case, I just say that the Ricci flow has done its job, and I'm just going to discard it. Okay? And I continue this. All right, so this flow was very powerful because it allowed Perelman to prove both the Poincaré and uh, geometrization conjectures. So it had very deep uh, topological applications. However, the flow does have a drawback. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, well, it was the program was started by Hamilton and Perelman um, finished it. Yeah. Um, there's a drawback, and this is that the surgery process is not canonical. Is it? Uh, in other words, the surgery process depends on a lot of parameters that we have to choose, and uh, the future evolution of the flow depends on the choice of these parameters. So, for example, the surgery pr uh, construction depends on the sorry the uh, oops. I have to put the arrows here. Uh, it depends on the size uh, delta of these cross-sectional two spheres. And in order for this construction to work, delta has to be small and positive. And there's just no canonical number that's both small and positive. Okay? And uh, even Perelman recognized this uh, drawback in both of his uh, groundbreaking papers, in which he writes roughly that there should be a more canonical Ricci flow that somehow flows through singularities on its own. All right, and so this question was then answered uh, by work of Kleiner and Lott, and then Kleiner and myself, where we showed the existence and uniqueness of a weak or singular Ricci flow that flows through singularities given any initial data. Okay, so given any initial data, there is such a nice flow that somehow flows through singularities on its own. And it's uniquely determined by its initial data and depends continuously on it. Okay. Um, so what this flow does the, is, you know, so I try to somehow indicate what this flow does here in this picture over here. So you, here you see some kind of uh, maybe cylindrical singularity that evolves. And then the singularity becomes this kind of double cusp uh, at the singular time. And then right after the singular time, kind of the singularity immediately resolves. Okay. So the surgery is effectively takes place at scale zero. Okay? And so the, somehow the, the flow kind of flows out of this uh, singularity. And so this is somehow how we, we should imagine this. So now it turns out that the precise definition of this singular Ricci flow is actually much nicer than the definition of a Ricci flow with surgery. It fits on about a third of a page or something like this. Still a bit too much for this talk, but let me just give you a little sense of like how this flow is defined. So this new flow is defined by a smooth four-dimensional Ricci flow space-time manifold that is equipped with some smooth structure such that locally this manifold looks like a Ricci flow, but globally it may have some non-trivial topology. Okay. And so the interesting thing here is that despite of its name, uh, this data that we're somehow using to describe this flow is completely smooth. And this is because we're actually only describing the singular flow on its regular part. So this is different than what you would, for example, do in mean curvature flow, where you have the level set flow or the Bracke flow that somehow aim to characterize the mean curvature flow equation through some viscosity or weak principle. Okay? So here in the Ricci flow, we're not able to somehow characterize the Ricci flow equation on the singular part of the flow. And therefore, we're just uh, leaving it out in the description. You can obtain it by taking completions of time slices. And instead of a characterization on the singular part, we somehow include some kind of asymptotic characterization near the singularities. Okay. And the fact that this is somehow enough is shown by this uniqueness result. It's really just it's enough to characterize the flow only on the regular part. All right, so this somehow answers Perelman's question, and it now also allows us to come up with some allowed us to come up with some topological consequences, uh, because we are now able to somehow evolve continuous families of metrics. So for example, using this result, we were able to show that the, metro, uh, the space of metrics with positive scalar curvature on any three manifold is either empty or contractible. Okay? 
And we were also able to prove uh, the generalized smale conjecture, which classifies the homotopy type of the diffeomorphism group of spherical space forms or some other um, um, geometric manifolds. All right. So I think this gives a pretty uh, satisfactory picture of Ricci flow in dimension three. So what I want to do is now, I want to go into one dimension higher. All right, so now if we go into one dimension higher, we really have to start from the beginning. We have to ask ourselves, what kind of singularities can we expect in four dimensional or higher dimensional Ricci flows? And so here it's instructive to look at an example. Um, and the example I want to discuss is due to a former graduate student of mine, Alexander Appleton, who wrote a very long paper uh, about a one, one very specific class of four-dimensional Ricci flows. So they had a cohomogeneity one uh, um, uh, uh, symmetry. And uh, for these Ricci flows, he could classify the possible blow-up limits. So in other words, he could, depending on some of the, the, the points x, i, t, i, and the rescaling factors, he would get different blow-up or singularity models, and he could classify what kind of models we would see. Okay? And so these models are the following. They are either the Gucci Hansen metric at some of the lowest scale, then they are the orbifold R4 mod Z2, so that's a cone over RP3, or the Brian Soliton mod Z2, so that's a rotationally symmetric metric with an orbifold singularity again, or the cylinder RP3 cos R. So these two uh, spaces here are in parentheses because in his work there are two cases and it's actually not que clear which case occurs. So either we see the first two blow-up models or all four ones. It's still an open question. All right, so these two spaces are Ricci flat and these two spaces are singular. They have orbifold singularity. So this is the first time that we see a singular singularity model in these flows. And I haven't talked really about gradient shrinking solitons, but gradient shrinking solitons are some of the expected singularity models for Ricci flows. And uh, these two uh, spaces would be uh, gradient shrinking solitons. That's not what won't be important for now. Okay. And then there's further work by Stolarski in higher dimensions and Li Tian and Zhu in, um, in the Keller Ricci flow case that somehow reinforced this conclusion that in order to understand the, um, the formation of singularities in higher dimensions, we need to allow singular blow-up limits. So for example, we need to allow orbifold singularities in the blow-up limits. All right, so, so now we have to come up with a theory that allows these limits. Okay, so, so let me now copy the slide from the last time where we discussed blow-up limits. So again, here's some Ricci flow. Think of a four-dimensional Ricci flow. And you take a sequence of blow-ups, uh, parabolic rescalings, and you converge to some singularity model. Okay, so now, as we've learned from the previous examples, this singularity model may have to be singular. Right? So we need some theory that allows some notion of a singular Ricci flow in the limit. And this is what I've done a few years ago. In some work, I've somehow came up, I came up with this definition of what I call a metric flow. So metric flow is some kind of a parabolic analog of a metric space. And it's roughly given by a family of metric spaces for every time t. And they're somehow related to one another uh, by probability measures that somehow relate points, uh, that somehow roughly say which points correspond to which points in different time slices. And they, are, they can be thought of conjugate heat kernels. Okay? So it's not, not, won't be that important, but there's some synthetic object here. We also need some kind of topology for the convergence and we need some compactness. And again, in the same work, I came up with this new definition of an F convergence and F compactness which can be thought of as gromov hausdorff convergence or one Wasserstein convergence or something like that. So this theory really, uh, I try to describe this as, as, as very natural and is, is what we would expect. Okay. Right, now we have the singular limit, but now we want to understand what the singular limit looks like. And in this case, we need to come up with some partial regularity properties of the limit. Okay. And so this is maybe the heart of this uh, work that, uh, um, uh, the, that that I put on the archive in 2020, which says that this limiting space has a reg uh, decomposition into a regular subset and a singular subset. And the singular subset has co-dimension at least four. So here is the, I take the dimension in the space-time setting and I'm assigning two points to the time direction. And the flow on the regular part is given by a smooth Ricci flow space-time structure that actually determines x uniquely. 
And so the nice thing here is that the smooth Ricci flow spacetime structure is exactly the same structure that we've already seen in the three-dimensional singular Ricci flow. And just as there, that structure already completely uniquely determines the entire flow. So this somehow should show us that we're already kind of on the right track here. All right? Okay, so now let me go one step further, but I think this is some of the, the main message that I want to show you. Like, let's say we want to understand these singularity models more precisely. Okay? So then there's one further construction that we can do. It. We can now take the singularity model, think of this as a singular flow that's defined for all negative times, and we can now scale it down. We can blow it down. We, take, we parabolically rescale it by factors that go to zero. Okay? So this way, we can analyze what the flow looks like at close to time minus infinity. Um, and in this case, we obtain a limiting ancient flow. And this limiting ancient flow is, in fact, the, smooth, the, the flow of a gradient shrinking soliton of co -dimension, with co-dimension four singularities. Again, I didn't tell you what a gradient shrinking soliton is, but it's a very nice model metric, some, something like an Einstein metric. And in dimension four, this gradient shrinking soliton is actually a gradient smooth orbifold. Okay? So the singularities are only orbifold singularities. And it, show, it shows exactly the picture that somehow was, was, was constructed by, by Appleton. And this, this, is somehow, this is exactly this, the same picture. All right, so now I showed you some theorems which contain a lot of new uh, notions, like uh, metric flows and f-convergence, which I didn't really define. So let me now show you two consequences of this theory, which are completely elementary, just to convince you that they, this, this theory is useful. Okay? So the first corollary of this theory gives us a very elementary characterization of the singularity formation of Ricci flows in dimension four. Okay? So it says the following, take some four-dimensional Ricci flow that develops a singularity at some finite time, then either if I rescale this flow, um, according to the remaining time, then the flow converges to a smooth, compact gradient shrinking soliton. Okay? So it co essentially converges to a metric that we somehow expect the flow to, is the, some of the best possible case that uh, it converges to this, this nice model metric. And then there's, there's no, not, not, much, not, much, not much more that we can improve this metric. So then we would be done. Or, and this is maybe the more interesting case, we can find a blow-up sequence along which we have smooth convergence to one of the following singularity models. Either a round S2 cross R2, some kind of cylinder, or a round spherical space form cross R, or, and this is some of the, the new thing in dimension four, a smooth Riemannian cone metric with non-negative scalar curvature. Okay. So again, I'm not saying that these here are all possible singularity models. I'm just saying that if the flow develops a singularity, then somewhere I see, an, um, a, then I see a region where the geometry looks like one of these three models. Okay. So, and I could also give you a more general theorem. So roughly speaking, these three models should be thought of as somehow describing the transition between where the flow becomes singular and where it survives the singular time. This is kind of the transition region. Okay, so this is one application. And then here's another application that I want to mention because I think it's quite cute. This is joint work with uh, uh, Charlie Zifarelli, uh, Ronan Conlon, who's also here today, and Alex Derwell, where we use this theory to show the existence of a Keller gradient shrinking soliton on the blow up of P1 cross C. So it's a new four dimensional gradient shrinking soliton. So this is diffeomorphic to the space. And some of the story behind this is kind of uh, interesting. So the, the last three authors conjectured that there might be one further gradient shrinking soliton in the Keller setting. And uh, they found nice properties of the soliton. But so it really just remained to show the existence of the soliton. And then what we did, we looked at one very specific Ricci flow. Um, and we used this theory of blow ups to show that there has to be uh, one blow up that is a Keller uh, gradient shrinking soliton, but it can't be any of the ones that we already know. And so therefore it has to exist. Okay? So it's a very backwards way of using Ricci flow to understand singularity models or not the other way around. All right, so let me get back to this theory of these uh, F-convergence and uh, metric flows. So this theory has the 
uh, additional benefit that it now allows me to somehow describe the conjecture that I always wanted to state in more detail. Right? So on the conjecture is very simple. It's, you know, which I've, you know, uh, probably had for a long time is that there is a some singular Ricci flow in dimension four starting from any four-dimensional Riemannian manifold. Yeah. It's just simply speaking, whatever we can do in dimension three, we can somehow also do in dimension four. But now I can make this very concrete. So I suspect that there is a metric flow, so it's just as what we see as limits of Ricci flows, that admits this regular singular decomposition such that the time zero slice is the given Riemannian manifold. The singular set again has co-dimension at least four, just as before. For ev almost every time the time slices are regular in the sense that the time slice is an orbifold with isolated singularities. And then between uh, some kind of uh, singularity, uh, there's some, I would say, controlled topological change. So I could make this more precise, but for the sake of this talk, let me just say, that the topological change is, I expect it to be only caused by either two or three surgeries, so they would correspond to the cylindrical singularities, the removal of compact gradient shrinking solitons, or the replacement of certain regions by kind of simpler, that have somehow become singular by some kind of sing, uh, simpler regions. Okay? So, which one? Is uh, uh, four plus two minus four, Co-dimension four, so it would have to have to be dimension two. Yeah. Um, uh, by simpler regions, so the important thing to note here is that unlike in the three-dimensional setting where we somehow can classify all possible singularity models, I don't expect that we can do this in dimension four. So I expect that there will be some regions which will just become singular, and they will somehow vanish in the flow, and they will be replaced by some nicer regions. And we won't be able to characterize these regions completely, but we'll have some properties that we can uh, the, 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 that we know that these uh, these regions fulfill. So, for example, these regions have positive scalar curvature, which gives us topological restrictions, or they have finite fundamental group. Okay? So, in my opinion, this is some of the most interesting question for me in Ricci flow right now, because it would, on an analytical level, show us that somehow this topological change that we've seen in the three-dimensional Ricci flow is not just an artifact of dimension three, but that there is some deeper connection between Ricci curvature and topological change. On a topological level, they, I expect that there will be some topological applications, uh, but these applications have to be chosen carefully so that they're not sensitive to some of the disappearance of these neighborhoods. Okay, so here are some two suggestions. So one, I refer to it just as the PSC conjecture, states that if you take a four-dimensional topological PSC manifold, so a four-dimensional manifold that admits a metric of positive scalar curvature, then M arises from topologically PSC orbifolds that have finite fundamental group uh, via zero and one surgeries. So this is kind of the reverse of the gromov lawson construction. This would somehow reduce the study of these manifolds here to the study of the corresponding orbifolds with finite fundamental group. And I should say, um, recently we published a, a small paper where we showed the weaker result, uh, where some of the finite fundamental group is replaced by uh, the first Betty number vanishing. And this was done uh, together with Chao Li and Christos Mantelidis, uh, and it was done using minimal surfaces. But I expect that somehow the minimal surface approach does not, does not suffice here to, to prove the entire conjecture. So, so really, Ricci flow is really the, the, the thing that we need to use here. And then, maybe I'm going, going a bit out on a limb here, but another possible application that would at least fit this picture would be this 11 eighths conjecture, which asserts a relation between the second Betty number and the signature of a four-dimensional spin manifold, which somehow finishes some of the uh, classification of simply connected uh, four manifolds, according to Friedman and Donaldson and Kirby. Yeah. So again, the idea here is that we may lose these regions that we can't topologically classify, but uh, we know that uh, under these uh, surgery processes, the second Betty number can only decrease and the signature will remain the same. So it's really not important to know what the topology of these lost regions is. But anyway, there, there are more ideas would have to be needed to, to prove this conjecture.
All right. Um, before I cha uh, change topic, let me see. Are there any questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That uh, unique, whether the flow is unique, so I think that that might not be true. I expect that they're, uh, especially due to these conical singularities, that they may admit different resolutions. Yeah. Um, and you could ask whether they are, the flow is unique, somehow assuming that you only have cylindrical singularities. And then I, I have some hope, but it might be very hard to show. But yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. All right. So let me move to the last part of the talk, um, which is a joint work with Eric Chen, where we are uh, disc to discuss the resolution of conical singularities. Yeah. So let me start again and think about this. Uh, um, I, I will try now try to approach this conjecture of the existence of a singular Ricci flow in dimension four. Yeah. So as we've seen in one of the, the theorems that I showed you before, one type of singularity that we can expect could be a conical singularity. Yeah. And so now the question that we've started out with is we asked, what do we do if we encounter a conical singularity? Okay, so here I try to draw a conical singularity. Now I need to somehow find a way of flowing a Ricci flow out of this conical singularity, with resolving the singularity. Okay, maybe I need to replace it by something nicer and smoother. Okay? So if you now think about this question, there are several strategies that you could try to follow. First of all, you could say maybe we can classify all the different conical singularities that we'll see in, the, in this Ricci flow. But these conical singularities correspond to co asymptotically conical gradient shrinking solitons, and uh, I don't expect that we'll ever be able to classify them. Okay, so we'll probably have to smoothen out every cone, at least every cone with positive scalar curvature. Um, then you could say, well, why don't we just glue in just some smooth metric in the cone? You know, this cone has positive scalar curvature, so the link also has positive scalar curvature. So it's a three-dimensional manifold with positive scalar curvature. So it's just a connected sum of spherical space forms and S2s cross S1s. So we can maybe write down a metric that kind of smoothens out this code. Well, you can do this, but then if you restart the flow from this metric, you may just run immediately run into another singularity that has this, this conical shape. Okay, so you haven't improved the flow. So you really need to smoothen out the metric by something that has higher entropy. So the entropy is some monotone quantity in this flow. And it turns out that writing down a metric with a lower bound on entropy is really, really hard. Okay? So it, you, you can't just write down a metric. You need to solve, an, uh, solve some PDE. And so now the approach that we've taken is that we um, um, try to find what is called a, an expanding soliton that's coming out of this cone. Okay? So let me now. Uh, define what an expanding soliton is. An expanding soliton is given by a Riemannian manifold that is equipped with a vector field v, and it should satisfy this generalization of the Einstein equation where we have this additional Lie derivative in here. Sometimes the vector field will be a gradient vector field, we'll see that later, and in this case the Lie derivative becomes a Hessian. Okay? And so we care about these metrics because these metrics come with an associated Ricci flow, which we obtain by taking the flow of this time-dependent vector field, pulling back the metric, and rescaling by t. Okay. So all the time slices are homothetic, and there's some kind of zero time slice, which is singular, which is essentially the blowdown of the soliton. Okay. Okay. And so now the goal will be, we want to find a, an expanding soliton that's asymptotic to a given cone. Okay. So if we can do this, then, we, then there's hope of flowing the Ricci flow out of this cone. And here's, again, the definition of what I mean to be asymptotic to a cone. So away from some compact subset, the pullback of the metric somehow approaches the conical metric. And again, I should say again, these cones that we encounter here have positive scalar curvature. All right. Um, OK, and so this is exactly what we did. And so here is our main result. It states that for any smooth cone metric on a cone Assuming that the link is diffeomorphic to a spherical space form, so this is the only topological restriction, uh, with positive scalar curvature, there is a gradient expanding soliton that's asymptotic to this cone. Okay, so this is uh, completely general. Okay? And so this completely somehow solves the question that I saw uh, that, that I asked before in the case where the link is diffeomorphic to a spherical space form. Okay? 
Okay, so before continuing uh, to discuss the theorem, let me give you some historical context. So first of all, previously there was a similar theorem where some positive scalar curvature was replaced by positive curvature operator. And in this case, the resulting metrics also have positive curvature operators. So this was done by Schultz and Simon. And then later de Ruel had somewhat presented another theory in which somehow uh, he also uh, obtained uniqueness of these solid points. Okay. But a uh, positive curvature operator is too strong. We may encounter cones that don't have positive curvature operators. So we really need positive scalar curvature here. Then let me draw the analogy for the mean curvature case. So in mean curvature, the analog of an, uh, of an expanding soliton would be a self-expander. And there's this nice identity that self-expanders for mean curvature flow are equivalent to minimal surfaces of this conformally changed metric. Okay? And this is a big deal because in mean curvature, this now allows the construction of self-expanders by a minimization process. Okay? And this, this, is, this is one way how you could show existence for self-expanders. However, for expanding solitons, no such analogy is known. Okay? So there's no way of constructing expanding solitons through a minimization process, at least not that I know. It would be interesting if somebody would find such an, uh, such an, an identity. So instead, we have to use another method. And the, the method that we're using here is degree theory. Okay, so now let me try to explain this degree theory to you. Okay. So what I want to do now is I want to define what I call the expander degree or expanding soliton degree. Um, and before doing this, let me just change the setup slightly here. So instead of talking about a cone and a link, let me first take a compact four-dimensional orbifold with boundary. Okay. Uh, if this is to come, uh, that satisfies some mild topological assumptions. So if this is somewhat too complicated, just think of x4 to be uh, the four disk. Okay. The four disk, the interior, it's diffeomorphic to R4, and the boundary is diffeomorphic to S3. So this is all that I want to uh, use. And then I'm going to look at the space of all asymptotically conical gradient expanding solitons on the interior of this, uh, uh, of this uh, manifold with boundary x. Okay? So for example, all asymptotically conical solitons on R4. And I want them to be conical somehow uh, at the end, which is somehow close to the boundary. So close to the boundary, I expect that I have some, some kind of asymptotics, which I won't get further into. And, um, um, and then they will be asymptotic to cone metrics on R plus cross the boundary. Okay. So again, in the, so the simplest example, the boundary would be S3. So we're coming kind of asymptotic to a cone over an S3. Okay. So this, this is somehow maybe, maybe a nicer way of putting things. And then we have a map, pi, which assigns to every asymptotically expanding, uh, asymptotically conical gradient expanding soliton it's cone at infinity. Okay, so this is the map pi. All right. So now let me assume for a moment that these two spaces happen to be compact manifolds of, um, of finite dimension and that pi is smooth. Um, well, in this case, uh, pi has a well-defined degree. And uh, we could ask if we can show that the degree is non-zero, then we know that pi is surjective. And well, unfortunately, these two spaces are not, um, uh, are, are not finite dimensional or compact. But nevertheless, we can still show that there is a well-defined expander degree, which is an integer. Okay. And this integer has the property that if gamma, being a cone in here, is a regular value of this map in a certain sense, then this degree can be computed by adding plus one or minus one over all the corresponding uh, gradient expanding solitons that are asymptotic to this cone. Okay? And the index here, we have to take minus one to the index of this Lignerol-Witzler Okay, So the important thing is here is if the expanded degree is non-zero, well then every cone in here is either a, a critical value, meaning that it has a preimage, or it's a regular value, and then this formula tells us that it has a preimage. So pi would be surjective. All right, so this is one theorem that we show. And then we show that in somehow the simpler case, where uh, the x is d4 mod gamma, that this expanded degree is equal to 1. Okay? And then this shows surjectivity of this map in this case. Okay? So I should say there are, of course, analogous degree results. This is not a new method. So for example, maybe one of the first uh, 
uh, applications to uh, uh, geometric analysis was due to Brian White, who um, uh, you know, uh, used, came up with a degree theory for minimal two disks. Then there's work of Anderson, Chang, and Ye for asymptotically hyperbolic Einstein uh, metrics. And then Bernstein and Wang for self-expanders for mean curvature flow. Yeah. So they kind of follow a similar idea, but as you'll see, the case of gradient expanding solitons is more complicated. And there are some uh, issues that we have to deal with. And I'll explain this uh, to you in the end. Okay. But before doing so, let me give you like a small outlook. So here is a conjecture that I uh, think should be true. Um, I expect that if you take a connected sum of d4s mod gammas, or d3 cross s1s, and here I take the connected sum at the boundary, so meaning that the boundary of this manifold is just the connected sum of the boundaries of each of the components, then I expect that this degree is non-zero. So this would imply then the existence of a gradient expanding soliton of positive scalar curvature for any smooth cone with positive scalar curvature. And so this would completely resolve the issue of resolving conical singularities in four-dimensional uh, Ricci flows. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I expect that this is equal to one. But, um, um, and so this would essentially be the glue in, what we would have to glue in, the type of manifold that we would have to glue into a conical singularity to continue the flow. All right, and so, great. M maybe, um, I, um, yeah, I don't, don't want to go too far, but I expect that once this conjecture has been proven, that uh, we can show the following theorem. So I call it a 90% theorem because it's a fairly technical theorem and I don't want to somehow approach it before the conjecture is proven. But I expect that um, if the conjecture is proven, then we can essentially solve um, the singular Ricci flow equation uh, through conical singularities. So in other words, we can show the following theorem. If the above conjecture is true, then there's a singular Ricci flow that's defined on a maximal interval time interval, and if this maximal time interval is finite, then this is because we encounter an, a, a cylindrical singularity, but no conical singularity in it anymore. Okay. So in other words, we can, we can construct this flow through conical singularities, and the only reason why we may not be able to construct it any further is because of the cylindrical singularity. Okay. I also believe that we can remove this part here. So I think this is somehow this theory theorem should be updated like every, you know, every so and so many years, and hopefully at some point we can remove both of these assumptions. All right, so this is, uh, this is somehow um, what I expect. Let me now, um, in the last three slides, get back to kind of the precise definition of the expanded degree. Yeah. Oh no, the 90% is because I, like, uh, uh, carrying out this theorem would ha mean to carry out like the whole kind of partial regularity discussion for Ricci flows with surgery and doing all these technical things and yeah I expect everything should work out but you know writing this up would be I don't know 200 pages and I haven't done it so that's why I, uh, I am 90% sure yeah I, I think I know how to flow and even if there's an accumulation I think that that should be possible yeah Yeah, thanks for the question. So, um, all right, so, so let me um, give you some more details on the definition of this expanded degree. So I'll just try to uh, uh, show some more technical details here, okay? So again, here is this uh, map that uh, we considered before where we want, of which we want to define this uh, degree. Okay? So again, these are, this is the space, kind of the moduli space of asymptotically gradient expanding uh, solitons. So I'll, let me just abbreviate this as M grad. And this is the space of cone metrics um, to on the kind of, uh, uh, whose link is the boundary of this manifold. So now we would like to define a degree theory, but unfortunately the problem here is that the domain on the left-hand side um, may not be a Banach manifold, and the map pi may not be a smooth map, um, you know, a smooth Fred Hall map, whatever is somewhat needed to run these uh, um, um, degree theories, okay? Um, and so the, the solution to this problem is that we have to extend pi to a larger space here that includes expanding solitons that are possibly not gradient. Okay, so this is the trick here. 
And if we do this, then it turns out that we also have to extend this space to models that are not necessarily cones, but what I call a generalized cone metric. Okay? So what's a generalized cone metric? It's something that looks like a cone metric, but we may have this um, mixed term in here, where alpha is some one form. Okay? So generalized cone metrics are spaces that are invariant under dilation. But for a cone, there we have this extra condition that the rays along which the dilation occurs are actually geodesics. Right? So for a generalized cone metric, these rays may not be geodesics anymore. This is some of the difference here. If there's some small ambiguity if somehow H has some killing field, then uh, we have to like pay a bit more attention. But otherwise, uh, there's some uh, 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 yeah, there's some clear um, uh, distinction between them. All right, so now let me extend this map pi. Let me call it pi prime. So they should be asymptotic to generalized cone metrics now. And I remove the gradient condition. Okay? And then I map to the set of generalized cone metrics. Okay? So let me call the space mx and the space generalized cone metrics. Okay? And so it turns out that this, this is this a nice correspondence. So for example, if you take a, uh, um, a gradient expanding soliton, then the image will almost always be um, an actual cone metric. Maybe there's an, another issue with these killing, uh, killing fields, but in, in, somehow in the generic case, uh, being gradient uh, kind of implies being conical, uh, being truly conical in, in, the, in the image. Okay? However, kind of vice versa, the opposite statement may not be true. So they could be non-gradient solitons, which actually are asymptotic to actual cones. Yeah, and this, this create some complication. All right, so, so this is some of the new setup. And now I hope to kind of uh, define a degree of this map. But we'll see that this also creates some issues. Okay? So and to, to illustrate this, let me draw a picture here. So I'll explain this picture briefly. So this here should indicate the space of all generalized cone metrics. And the green line here is uh, the subspace of all con truly conical metrics. Okay? So we essentially want to work over this subspace. And then here is the manifold, like the moduli space of all expanding solitons, possibly non-gradient. And I've marked the ones that are gradient in green. So you see that whenever I have a gradient one, it maps to some green point. But there may be non-gradient expanding solitons that also map to this green point. Okay, so this is some of the picture. And, and the, kind of the issue here is that we may see have critical points of this map pi prime uh, right over the cone metric. So that's why we have to look at the space of generalized cone metrics. Okay. All right, so now I'll, I'll just run through a, a few ingredients that we use to come up with this regularity theory. Okay, so I, I, I recognize that this might be a bit fast, but just want to give you an idea of what is needed here. Okay. So first of all, we show that there is some neighborhood of this set of gradient expanding solitons. Uh, which can be equipped with a C1 alpha Banach manifold structure and such that the map pi prime restricted to this neighborhood is a C1 alpha Fredholm map with uh, Fredholm index zero. Okay, so this is what's needed for a degree theory. But this is only true for this kind of open neighborhood of the set of gradient expanding solitons. Okay? So it's not, uh, we, there's no Banach manifold structure over this set. Then we show that this map pi restricted to the green part here is proper. So that's the other ingredient that's needed for a degree theory. Okay. Again, it's maybe not proper if we look at it over the entire preimage of the set of cones. Okay. And then, as I mentioned before, it might be true that the preimage of the set of cones consists of components that are not gradient. However, and so this is somewhere where kind of most of the innovation comes in, uh, and where we kind of use some, some new um, identities. Um, uh, we show that this set of gradient expanding solitons is actually a union of C infinity path components of this preimage. Okay? So there might be some black part here, but it's not connected to the green part. All right. And then, OK, this may be a bit more technical, so you can disregard it if you want to. Um, if you take now a real analytic finite dimensional submanifold of the set of cone metrics, then the preimage 
um, ends up being a real analytic sub-variety, so it's locally connected. And therefore, if we somehow look at the subset of all the gradient expanding solitons within this variety, then it consists of a set of connected components. Yeah, and this is exactly um, uh, what we need. And then it turns out that if you could combine these ingredients, one through four, then it's actually possible to define a degree notion, a local degree over every point gamma in here of pi prime, that somehow only depends on the behavior of the map pi prime in that neighborhood u near kind of the gradient expanding solitons. So this degree theory completely disregards what the map does over here. Okay? And uh, the local degree is locally constant. Okay? And then, um, uh, then we just use the final ingredient, which uh, says that the set of these cone metrics, remember they have positive scalar curvature, is uh, path connected. Okay? So we can connect any one with another one. So the, the local degrees have to be the same everywhere. Okay? And this is just equivalent to saying that the set of possible link metrics uh, with positive uh, with scalar curvature bigger than six is path connected. And this follows by work of Marquez if the boundary is uh, diffeomorphic to S3, or, or by Bruce Kleiner and myself um, uh, in the case uh, in the, for the general case. Yeah. And so this, this concludes uh, this theory. All right, um, I think this is all I want to say. Um, I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, are there any uh, further questions for the speaker? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I would expect that there are more shrinkers. I think um, I expect that there's maybe a shrinker that's somehow asymptotic to a cone, but a cone over some kind of neck pinch. So near the neck pinch, it's asymptotic to an S2 cross R2, but then uh, kind of if you look, if you blow it down, it looks like a cone over a three dimensional neck pinch. I mean, you know, I, I expect is like a big word. I just I, I think there's like, it's a 52 versus 58, 48 chance that something like this exists. Yeah. But yeah, um, but you know, in the mean curvature flow, there are many, uh, many shrinkers, so I expect that there's just more. Yeah. Okay, other, another question here. Uh, the choice of uh, which metric, the, uh, the the metric on the cone? Yeah, so it's, it's locally constant uh, um, on here. So for every for every cone metric here, you can define an expanded degree. And it's locally constant on the space. But since the space is co uh, connected, it's the same everywhere. So it really doesn't depend on the cone metric that you're choosing. It only depends on the topology of, um, of the manifold that you're looking at. Okay. So th actually, it's a nice characterization of our uh, of D four of the four disk. If you take some uh, manifold that has non-zero expander degree and has boundary S three, then it has to be diffeomorphic to um, D four. So if you want to prove the smooth Poincaré conjecture, you would need to show that the expander degree is non-zero. But I, it's probably very hard. Another question. In gradient one? Oh yeah, okay, so, um, well, if you take an expanding soliton, uh, then you can look at some of the, the, the variational equation and the, uh, the, the, the kind of the, the linearization of the equation. And uh, this equation, um, since, since you're working, you're basically working, so it, you, you basically have to work near a point in here, which is an, a gradient expanding soliton. And then you look at the linearization of the equation. So this linearization may have a kernel, but it's only finite dimensional. And so then, uh, then you somehow so locally um, look at kind of, um, you know, construct variations of this equation given that, like variations on the, on the boundary. And, and so, so, so this only works if you, if kind of your basis space is, is a gradient expanding soliton. So. Okay, so there's some 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 kind of you know what I maybe haven't said is that these this analysis um, that allows us to uh, find this um, 
expanding uh, this, this, uh, this Banach manifold structure relies on somehow studying these kind of um, Lignarovitz operators. And they're somehow L2 conjugate, but only with a measure that somehow diverges at infinity. So you have to be a bit careful. Um, but, but yeah, but uh, there's a theory by, uh, by Dirwell that somehow we generalize and that we can somehow use these there. I don't know, does it address your question? Or? So, so, so locally, we can, we can somehow, yeah, basically it's some implicit function theory to, to solve. Uh, to somehow construct like uh, very like variations uh, in here. Is, um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I was wondering about what about the properness? Is that a compactness theorem? Yeah, it's a compactness theorem, and the um, uh, so the compactness uses uh, yeah. So yeah, it's a compactness theorem. It's basically a Cheeger uh, Gromov compactness theorem. And it uses kind of the um, monotonicity of, of the entropy, um, Perelman's entropy, to establish like uniform injectivity radius bounds um, and uniform. Um, uh, and then the, um, this topological condition ensures that it, for this compactness theorem, we don't have any instantons that show up. Okay? So, um, and therefore, that shows us that we have a curvature bound. Okay? So if you take a sequence of, uh, of spaces in here, uh, then you want to ensure that uh, they, they have uniformly bounded curvature, so you can take a cheeger gromov limit. And if they don't, then you could extract an ALE space as a limit. And then the, the, this topological condition is used to rule it out. Okay, if no other questions, let's thank the speaker again.